Hello everyone, welcome to today's Carter webinar. Uh, my name is Rich Whalen. I am your host of the session. And before we get underway, um, I just want to let you know about a couple things. First, a little bit about Cutter Consortium. Uh, what I want to highlight here is our access to the experts approach. We have absolutely no ties with any vendors. Uh, we deliver our research in, all of, uh, in, in that respect. All of our uh, senior consultants are experts in their respective fields. And as a Cutter member, you do get honest to God access to the experts and um, you, we can connect you with these, these people to help you through issues you may be having. Um, a little bit of how you can ask questions of the session. As you know, as you're seeing, you have the toolbar on the right-hand side. Uh, there is an area for questions. You simply type your questions in, in, that, in the box and, and send them on to us. We will get to them at the end of the session. Uh, if your um, question has to do with the logistics or something along those lines, I will reply privately to you via chat. And now a little bit about Wilhelm Lerner, who is uh, the host of today's, uh, the, the uh, consultant on today's session. He is a senior consultant with Carter Consortium and an Arthur D. Little partner. His work focuses on strategy and organization development, as well as marketing, customer, and sales excellence to accelerate growth and transformation at the corporate and business unit level. He is passionate about helping clients build game-changing strategies and identify sustain sustainable sources of competitive advantage to win the hyper-competition battle. Mr. Lerner works with his clients to build dynamic organization capabilities and deliver high-impact, fast-track transformation. So I turn it over to Wilhelm. Welcome, Wilhelm. Thank you, Rich. Um, pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to sharing some of the things that have uh, become quite uh, close to my heart over the last uh, decade. Um, probably three words of context to my person. I'm 30 years with Arthur De Little. I'm part of a consulting firm. I uh, spent uh, probably the first 20 years of my 30 really working on strategy and strategy design, strategy definition in a broad range of, of sectors. I come from a fast moving consumer goods background, but have to work across a broader variety of clients and sectors uh, down to high tech and uh, manufacturing, as well as service sectors, um, et cetera. Um, probably about five to 10 years back, we started and I started observing that a lot of the strategy projects we were running um, resulted in uh, conclusions or recommendations or strategies that actually moved away from the, the historic legacy core of the clients we were working for and uh, put in uh, recommendations on moving further into adjacent or even further out and uh, also in the last five years more disruptive ways of looking you know at the current uh, industry scope in converging sectors working with automotive clients now looking at uh, electricity and electric infrastructure or energy clients um, having to put in um, more service elements, telecom clients moving down to um, totally new business models, et cetera. In that context, uh, the thing that struck me and the colleagues that have been with us and Arthur D. Little has a long history working on innovation and organization, that a lot of these things we wrote on paper actually did not get implemented or not implemented in a speed and uh, rigor that was required to actually you know get the benefits from what we wrote on paper if we are a little black and white so we started looking a closer uh, uh, view at what is it what what was happening there and really we started understanding that organization divined in a very broad term meaning you know people and the culture structure and processes but also the steering and leadership and also the way how companies transform and organizations were part of what um what, what, what was impediment to that and what i'll now share with you in the next 30 to 35 minutes is um you know have you, you know go with me through parts of that journey we've been going through the last three to five years um 
which has been a journey on trying to understand um, why is organization now probably more important than ever before. Um, and that's the first bullet because we believe that in the post productivity age we're now moving into, there is new patterns or paradigms of success which require capabilities of organizations that historically have been probably incompatible or not been, you know, been under one roof in an organization and therefore they're, they're challenged significantly. We've developed a uh, an organization canvas um, where we've uh, over the last one to two years um, worked through an initial set of uh, close to 30 companies to understand um, what is changing and how what kind of separates you know, companies that deal quite well with that new hybrid requirements and what separates them from others. Um, and we've kind of described those pattern um, and I'll go through some of the pattern of some companies and and explain you know what differentiate them and uh, this and we've kind of you know went back and used the term of ambidextrous which is not our term it's a term you know being coined by a couple of guys Tushman and a couple of others but it's a good you know a good headline for what, what we're looking at and then I'll kind of finish off looking at, at some things that we found helpful um, in working with clients um, that target to reinvent, redesign, um, reshape um, their organizations and use those to um, you know, reflect on a couple of development paths that we've, uh, um, more precisely three, that we've uh, been observing. Um, and uh, discuss, you know, what in our mind is important to kind of move forward and be successful. So getting started and um, looking at the first, uh, the, the first point, which, uh, Rich, uh, I'm actually not able to move the slide, Rich, funnily enough. Let me see. Ah, here we go. No, nope. works now again. Thank you. So if we kind of look a little bit at the context, um, the way we look at it at the moment is that if we go 50, 100 years back, we were, you know, in a productivity area, then working into and moving into mass production. And uh, that has been, you know, driving things like scale and efficiency as a success paradigm been things when I started consulting, which have been, you know, around business process re-engineering, optimization, efficiency, ERP era, uh, then coming up. Um, but practically what has happened, if we look at the last, you know, the 90s and uh, the first decade of this century, a lot of the organization work we've been doing has been centering around um, optimizing input and output. So, you know, getting more output with the same input um, in, from an organizational perspective, uh, the whole lean principles, delayering, simplifying, centralization, shared service centers, um, et cetera, have all been driven by that. If we now look in the last five to 10 years, you know, the IT digitalization has moved in. And that's what we call and you can use tons of words for that, but like a little bit the productivity age, where really, you know, small startups um, are able to challenge uh, large corporates and speed and creativity has become a success pattern that um, has emerged as being probably as important and for certain businesses more important. So we're seeing now that you know, that they're the, the large firms, the successful firms, in a way are able to you know, play both sides of that coin. And that uh, has been an, an observation that is also shared by, um, by a, you know, an analysis from the 
um, from the conference board that annually collects the top CEO challenges. And this is from 2011, a couple of years to today. And you see, we've highlighted, and I used the color red and blue. Um, there you see number one, that human capital has kind of moved up into the top number one concern and organization in a broader term is the envelope in which human capital sits. So the whole issue of people, people retention, organizations, and the ways how people engage in a company has moved into a top number one spot. And then over time, we see that whole topics around innovation and digitization and customer, which are typically um, more front end market topics are among the top five and operational excellence and regulation and risk are equally there. So if you look at the top five and we now have the latest one has come out, it's the same situation. Companies are really challenged on the one side to deliver scale, operational excellence, cost, cost benefits, et cetera. But equally so, they, uh, they need to and are challenged to adapt to changing customer requirements. They're moving a lot faster to put in innovation and uh, digital models that are often very contradictory to their current you know, legacy business, and it's it's these two things um, need to happen at the same time, and that is really what we are. If we discuss with senior executives, has become quite a bit of their their mind space in a way that uh, they say, you know, I uh, one one CXO, one CEO from a two billion euro a construction firm here in Europe said to me, you know, I have to wear constantly two hats. You know, if I move from meeting to meeting, in the first meeting, I'm wearing the hat of, you know, pushing innovation and driving it. And in the next meeting, I'm the cost down guy trying to, you know, really aggressively, um, you know, work on our cost base, centralization, etc. So this is really the thing which we have observed and which has, has occupied quite a bit of space in our clients. And that was, in a way, also the, the point where we try to understand what are, what are organizational capabilities that really help companies um, to do one and the other at the same time. And we've tested and co-developed that with a handful of large firms here in Europe with their organization development teams and uh, then tested that and worked with uh, initial set of 30 companies. And I'll quickly walk through, walk you through the thinking and the approach behind that, and then show you pattern of companies. So the thinking behind that, uh, you'll see on this slide, on the left-hand side, we have a framework where we said, what is important in, in organizational design on a very high level in organization development? And on the right hand side, we have uh, a set of capabilities that uh, we kind of allocated to them. So if you look at the, the organizational framework, at the centerpiece, uh, we, we have the strategy and the direction of the firm and how it wants to create value. You have the process and structure dimension, so left bottom to bo top right which deals with organization setup, internal collaboration and external collaboration. And on the, the other side with process management, process governance and systems and technology. You have the people and culture dimension that really looks at roles and responsibilities, how companies learn, competence management. And on the other side, uh, topics around leadership, corporate climate, identities and values that shape the soft side of an organization. And then in the horizontal axis, you have the, the, the steering layer, which is how is direction set, um, how are decisions taken, and how is performance management um, you know, implemented, and what are the principles of performance management. And on the other side, what are the attitudes towards uh, transformation from a 
mentality, mental attitude, mechanisms, but also the drivers or the motivation for that. All of that is, and you'll see around circle, is basically the operating model, which kind of outlines the fundamentals. And um, <clears throat> we then set out, um, once we had that codified, to say, now, if we look at the, the world out there, looking from very small startups to very large corporate enterprises, um, looking from private uh, profit-oriented businesses on the other side to non-profit and, 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 and looking from manufacturing to service, what are organizational capabilities and building blocks that we find out there? How can we describe them for those design elements I've just laid out? So you'll see on, this, on the left-hand side, those six design dimensions, then the design elements, which I've highlighted per dimension. And then we've basically in probably a, yeah, a 12 to 18 month exercise discussing with, of course, colleagues here at Arthur De Little. But as I said, with organization development um, professionals in a handful of large corporations, we've kind of defined those blocks and those little four segmented building blocks in each of the dimensions. And on the highest level, we then started out to uh, create a description that helps us to talk through with management teams or employees and others to have a very high level understanding of how much of each of these four building blocks an organization is really good at um, today. Um, and this is just an example here. This is the, we're in the structure dimension and it's internal collaboration. And that really centers around the question, how is internal collaboration enabled? Um, and the, the capabilities we found, uh, you know, spreading out the spectrum of things we find out there range from hierarchy, which is really a vertical and horizontal cooperation via defined interfaces. Work is mainly performed with informal organizational units down to organizations that have a collaborative environment, uh, how we call it. So topics irrespective of organizational context are a central focus of collaboration. Exchange between employees is strongly fostered. Boundaries of work and non-work related interaction become blurred. You have in the middle things like cross-functional teams, which most likely you're aware of, or enablers like collaborative platforms. And what we started doing is, you know, going through with, with those 30 firms um, to say now, to what extent is your current organizational structure, um, you know, does hierarchy as an internal collaboration mechanism does not apply, so we gave them a one, or fully applies, gave them a four. And that's what we did across, you know, all four and across all of these um, design elements and um, uh, design dimensions. That gave us a set of 30 companies, um, which ranged from, you know, Spotify on the one hand to a nuclear power plant on the other side, from airlines to large um, banks, etc. So we tried to you know, look at the extreme spectrum of organizations and businesses we could find out there to have a, a set of, um, you know, data we could really um, work on and try to understand to which extent these differ or are similar. And what we really found out is that there is not too many but that there are some organizations that blend old and new pattern in something which is <laughs> ambidextrous, but not a lot of companies or organizations are actually capable or actually having that fully implemented. So <clears throat> to give you an example, <clears throat> a 
and a couple of examples you you see that canvas back here um and uh, if a box is highlighted green it means the uh, rating of either an individual person or sometimes you do it in workshops with teams is on a scale from one to four 3.25 or higher so they basically say this applies fully if it's yellow it's a rating of 1.75 to 3.25 which means it's somehow established but uh, not very strongly and if it's lower than a 1.75 on that little four point scale um, it's a gray box now what we started understanding is that um, and you see that here that there is um, organizational pattern that are usually coined and codified it by certain capabilities that together form what we at the moment call an organizational system and organizational systems are typically a combination of soft elements so people and culture and structure and process in this case here this is a global um, automotive supplier german company roughly 50 billion euro turnover that's the pattern there uh three teams of global org developers coined and was discussed on their top level so you see you have a very much a pattern that delivers stability scale efficiency what do i mean with that their roles and responsibilities if we go to the bottom are very controlled their knowledge management and learning is very expert based their competencies are very much centered around professional skills. Their leadership is transactional. So it's very much, I give you an incentive, you deliver against it, or it's incentivized. Corporate climate is very much rules and discipline. Um, the setup is very much scale and function centric. Internal collaboration is around hierarchy. Their process management is very standardized and their systems and technology are very much geared towards delivering efficiency on automation. So this is not untypical for a um, automotive supplier. It's geared towards delivering high quality and output as an organization in a highly controlled environment. And not astonishingly, the steering and transformation capabilities fit to that. Direction setting, we are now on the top, is a lot around strategic clarity, decision making around data and rationale, performance management around people and performance. The transformation is around temporary structures. So we put projects in and then we transform and motivation for transformation has a lot to do with professional management. So this is a very professionally managed data and facts driven steering and transformation. If you simplify that picture, and you'll see that now for a couple of other firms, and you take the left hand side, which basically says, you know, where you saw that uh, a lot of the green dots linked, if you take all those capabilities in that part of the canvas, they usually are descriptive for a productivity system. So stability, efficiency, standardization, very much you know limited to change but very efficient in input output if you see now here 81 percent established it means that in average for those capabilities in that box which is people and culture they have an average of between three and four so closer to a four so it's quite well established um at the bottom we have 69 percent that's closer to a three we started learning that anything between around 65 to 75, 80 percent means that that productivity system is established. What do I mean with that? If in that firm, you would stop today um, investing any money and management resource into lean. If you look at that firm three years from now, they would still do lean the same way as we do it as they do it today. That's what we mean with a stable system. Um, not astonishingly, their leadership style steering and transformation at the top is also in that corner but their ability to change transform innovate be agile is rather weakly established the red boxes are just around the 25 percent so a score around 1.75 to 2 so it's not strongly established 
if we take another profile and i'll go a little faster this is a streaming provider this is one of the large very very successful streaming providers you now see here starting to emerge a pattern where on the right hand side you see an organizational innovation and disruption system that works to very different um, capabilities. It has roles and responsibilities that are more autonomous. Their knowledge management in learning is to some extent very trial based. Corporate climate in innovation and market creativity and disruption. Their external collaboration has a lot to do with generating value in partnership networks building collaborational platforms internally. Their process management is multi-lane and adaptive. Their process governance is very much user-driven and insight and foresight is very important. The related steering and transformation mechanism has a lot of elements around iterative collaboration, shared vision for direction setting. Conviction and belief is important in decision-making in an uncertain environment. Their transformational attitude is quite revolutionary. They try to be new. And motivation has a lot to do with personal advancement and inspiration. That is very different to what you just saw in that automotive supplier. They have a couple of things on the left-hand side, which because they have a back end where they still have some scale. If you look at the high end numbers, you see here a very different pattern. You see a pattern of a firm that has a quite strongly established creativity system, which has very different characteristics than the automotive supplier we just talked about. It has already started building up some, um, some uh, productivity and performance elements, but not as strong as what we saw before. And it has a quite balanced steering and transformation attitude. So this is, an example of one of a startup that is already quite mature. We have startups that are, you know, a year, two, three years old. They have almost no blue and have a lot of red. Um, so that is, you know, a little bit at the other side of the spectrum. And then we came to firms that have uh, a well blended mix of both. And this here is uh, the pattern of one of the firms we found. This is 3M. It's a quite balanced pattern. You see, um, fundamentally, on the left-hand side, the blue link green boxes, um, which have a very strong performance management element and which very much resemble the boxes of the automotive supplier. And you see, on the right-hand side, a pattern which is much closer to the pattern. It has differences, but it's closer to the pattern of um, the uh, streaming provider. And you also see at the top level, so steering and transformation, that they have quite a good balance in their senior leadership um, st uh, strata of having you know, a lot of strategic clarity, data rational, performance, uh, professional management, but at the same time, allowing for conviction, belief, revolutionary elements, um, people, personal advantage, et cetera. So it's a balanced pattern that really then ends up in what we see here. So it's a quite balanced setup of a firm that can, on the one hand side, you know, deliver really standardized, high output, low cost, um products um uh, processes etc but at the same time is able to continuously reinvent itself and has an overlaying quite hybrid balanced steering and uh, uh leadership um attitude now that has not evolved from today to tomorrow that's the result of a multi-decade journey but it's been established quite well I have one more example of a um, of a firm. This is basically the pattern of Amazon. Um, so in Amazon, you see something similar. You have parts of Amazon that are very established, very standardized. Um, if you look at their um, logistic centers, um, they do, they're not changed worldwide. Um, if you look at your cloud uh, computing um, backup, backbone, backend, not 
highly standardized, not changed, but at the same time, and uh, their their organization at the market front end, it's not worth tracking the, uh, the the organizational structures. They dissolve quite quickly. They're quite aggressive, building up new businesses, and their their steering element is very balanced, and their transformation attitude is actually very aggressive and very proactive um, in that sense. Um, and I'll not, you know, push you through um, the details of that, but those were two firms uh, which we actually found that have a very balanced profile where we started understanding that it is actually possible in one organization to um, really build capabilities that on the one hand side deliver you a lot of economies of scale, a lot of cost um, competitiveness, but also enable an organization to be highly innovative, um, highly uh, aggressive, even disruptive, and able not only in their product dimension, but innovate itself from the bone in, um, in many aspects. So that was fundamentally a journey we've kind of walked through, and these insights are about now 12 to 18 months old. And that's where we really said, you know, if we look at all of these insights, you could uh, rightfully so go back to the, you know, to the original thinking of, of guys like Riley and Tushman, where you have, you know, on the one hand side, an ability to exploit current resources, which has a lot to do with scale, evolution, corporate control, monitor, cause and effect, optimize cost. And at this, and the other side, having a strong ability to explore new ways to create value, which has a lot to do with speed, a lot to do with revolution, startup mentality, trial and error, tr creating new things and disruption. From the 30 companies we have in our sample at the moment, these were two. We're currently beefing up with our study little, the sample in the next three months with a target to moving up to um, 200 companies to kind of broaden that. But that whole combination of, of you know, a, a bipolar, um, approach I have uh, found back with a lot of senior executives I've had roundtables with in the last 12 months, about 10 roundtables where we had guest speakers that um, talked about their individual journey. And a lot of them use other words like speedboat and puckboat or um, um, other terms. But in many cases, they refer to the same principles. And um, if you look at, and I'll, you know, in, in the order of time, um, if you look at some of the higher level organizational levers or meta capabilities to do productivity and performance, which are displayed on, on this side, um, like, you know, if you look at structure, a structure scale is very important, centers of scale or scope are at the center of thinking, delayering business partner organization, et cetera, in a lot of interface management. So very precise definitions, how one unit talks to another process management that's centered around first time right and process efficiency, people management that is very much, you know, centered around competence management, future of workplace and a steering that is very much performance management driven KPIs, incentives, and has a lot to do with resource planning, staffing, et cetera, and has a lot to do with digital enablers that actually facilitate those standardization efforts, is very contrary to the, um, let's see, uh, here we go, to the uh, organizational capabilities of companies that are very creative, very offensive, very disruptive, very fast. Their structures typically are characterized by a decentral element, self-organizations, you know, words like um, holacracy, Spotify engineering culture, et cetera, 
are often, you know, driving their structural thinking. Their processes are typically rather customer connected and customer centered and are very much driven by a thinking of iterative processing. So Scrum, Less, Nexus, whatever you use. Their people management has a lot to do with trust and empowerment and skill and talent development because they're much more working on you know, creating that and they're steering in contrast to before where it's a lot about KPIs and resource management. Here is much more driven by visionary leadership, purpose driven, beyond budgeting, liberated companies or some buzzwords around that, or they focus a lot on next decision practices. Um, where they really think quite a bit on how do I decide in a certain decision context in a very standardized environment where you are really, you know, in a very top-down manner, senior management decides versus decision practices where you um, are in a very uncertain environment that work very differently. A lot of the accelerators here have not to do with IT support, but more with linking inside and outside on the structure side. So linking up with startups, incubators, whatever. They, they work a lot on data and AI. Learning organization is something that's coming back in these, in these companies. And usually <laughs> they are quite transparent in their indicators. So if we take these two you know, very different sets of capabilities of organization, of course, the real question is now, if you want to move from an organization that have a lot of the blue um, capabilities towards having more red, um, how do you get from A to B? And what are enablers or development paths that we found um, you know, insightful? Um, we've basically started thinking around three aspects in moving organizations. One has a lot to do with understanding strategic requirements or business requirements, very much so like the intersection with IT and business. I mean, I, you know, an organization is a means to an end. So you have to understand and find ways to, under, to describe and codify what are the business requirements and what are and, and to link them to organizational development so we've looked at elements to understand what are the requirements then we need to link them to the organizational part and start innovating the organization that has to do with aspects around operating blueprint so what are the fundamental mechanisms on how the interaction of individual organizational elements work. So do I have a manufacturing backbone and market-facing business units? Are market-facing and organizational backbones I'm integrated in one business unit, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the fundamental setup of, of an organization on a very high level and trying to look at what's the blueprint today and if we think about our strategy in a sense of strategy map, customer engagement, um, et cetera, how do we set that up in five years from now in order to you know, deliver against that strategy? The, 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 the twin to that is really how do we work in that blueprint? So what are new ways of working? We've worked a lot with you know, setting up agile teams, um, scaling them. Um, as one element, but many other aspects. So those are two you know, ways of trying to think about innovative, minimal viable organizational constructs. Um, and you need quite a bit of momentum around uh, to enable them and start them and build them. But at the same time, you need to think very thoroughly in our experience around, if you now change and move and experience things, what are really the elements that hold the organization together? What's the glue? Um, once you have, and we have a range of transformations we've accompanied over years, once you have that done, you really want to now scale that up and transform that into a broader scope. If you're coming from blue to red or red to blue. 
that really then centers for us around a lot of things, but the two things that we really um, consider important is A, the leadership challenge, because once you, you build up a new you know, organizational element beyond pilots or minimal elements, you really need a leadership team a senior leadership team, the top 10, the top 100, the top 1,000, whatever the number is in the size of the firm, where you have a sufficient amount of people and the number that pops up is usually 20, you know, a quarter to a third of new thinking in that leadership team so that you can really equilibrate the two elements. And the other real critical element is that you have to find ways to bridge those contradictions or paradoxons. The 3M people have that rule that you can spend 10% of your time in certain areas on things that you want to work on. But you don't get those 10% if you don't fulfill and match your very hard-coded KPIs, which you have to deliver against quarterly by quarterly. And that's what, I, what we mean with bridging paradoxons or managing paradoxons. It's, Inside 3M, if you don't match your KPIs, a lot of people will not even dare to take their 10% of time. So it's, a, it's an equilibrated system. And those two elements, leadership and those paradoxons, are very important when scaling things like that up. And I'm close to finishing. What are now in that little matrix and um, development paths we've observed? Um, with organizations we've worked with. Um, one is what we call a blueprint-driven approach. This is very much a starting point um, of transformation is that a firm says we have to change our operating blueprint um, because our strategy says something. We've worked for a large consumer goods firm that was very innovative. They said we now have to become in top of innovation world class low cost. What does that mean? And that's where they started their operating blueprint. And then they work towards implementing step by step ways of working to actually work into that blueprint. So that's very much a strategy inspired but organization driven thinking. There is a total other end of the spectrum of, of firms we've worked with and, and, and senior leaders, what we codify purpose driven. That is, the starting point for them is not so much a target operating model. It's more a corporate purpose that is changing. Um, that is, uh, for instance, um, we're working with a large construction firm where the purpose has really uh, moved from, you know, we're trying to deliver a constant EBIT to our shareholders, which is a family, towards really, you know, moving EBIT as a funding mechanism on the second layer, but uh, trying to uh, move towards a purpose that says, we want to reinvent the firm, we want to grow, we want to disrupt, you know, the world out there. And that is the purpose we're working for. That's the reason why we're changing. And they've not codified in detail how they get there. And they've not at all codified on what their future organization will look like. They very much, and many of these firms work along initiatives that they really push forward to create tangible momentum in their organizations that then at some point in time, you know, require a reformulation and an adaption of their operating model. But it's only when it becomes so apparent that a lot of their initiatives really need a new organizational envelope that they start really talking about this. Their key concern is mobilizing, creating energy, and creating movement forward. Um, both of the, the first and the second typically have a very high ranking change or transformation or disruption agenda that is in the background. There is a third type of firms and there is a large um, railway operator we work with here in Europe that is much more trying to put digital in the heart of the firm. So it's a lot about optimization. Um, and 
they really work and we work with them very hard on ways of working in order to change the way how the company operates and um, then that usually requires quite a bit of effort in trying to you know, keep momentum and at some point in time they will change their operating blueprint but it's a very different mechanism so these are three development paths which we've observed and uh, i'm uh, one slide away from uh, opening the floor for uh, questions um the three gaps we typically have seen in all of these you know instances where we work with firms or where we step in, into organizational transformation is a big gap very often is that the reasoning why things change so the link between business and organization is not very well articulated and by far not very convincing um and that is a huge gap which falls on your feet in the process the second one is that when starting to innovate, that the mobilization is kind of second priority. So working on the soft side, momentum governance, organizational glue, all of these things are moving in the background and the subject matter moves in the front end. And you then feel that you get stuck because you're not working on the soft side. And when scaling up, a lot of firms are typically very much engaged and occupied by trying to push the content forward. But actually, they need to work on making the rest of the organization that is not yet changed uh, much more receptive and opening up towards the new ways of working or the new concept or the new, um, the new organizational paradigms or capabilities. And in that sense, that is probably the hardest challenge you can have is, you know, moving your leadership, you know, at that point into a position that they really um, move the needle, um, engage and, you know, push the, the initiative and the journey very aggressively forward. So that brings me to the end of uh, my um, presentation and content I've uh, uh, I've uh, prepared to share and uh, of course now I'm eager and interested uh, to see if there is any questions um, concerns clarification add-ons from the group in the webinar room okay well thank you very much for an informative presentation uh, for uh, the attendees, you can type in your questions in the toolbar, the, uh, the, the GoToWebinar toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen, and type them in. If you have any comments as well to share, please type those in, and we'll get to them as they come in. Uh, Wilhelm, the first question is, I'm very, skepti I'm very skeptical of another strategy for scale. There's yeah. usually excuses to retain wasteful complexity for its own sake, codifying Im impediments to value flow as policy. How is this different? Yeah. I, I completely share that comment, um, uh, reflecting on it. Uh, yes, the focus of the work we're doing currently is not so much on uh, finding new ways to create more efficient organizations. So the blue side of the, of the concept, because most of the, for most of our clients, that has been done over the last 10 to 20 years. There is, of course, clients that have not done that, then that's part of that. But the, the, the majority of clients and companies we work with is trying to find the appropriate balance. And if you're a nuclear power plant, you don't need to become fully ambidextrous and develop a fully aggressive red side, but you need to build capability. So it's not about you know, new scale mechanisms, <coughs> probably some elements, it's like, robotic process automation or a couple of other things to kind of you know optimize the long tail of um of efficiency improvement but it's more about finding the right equilibrium um for a business in its organizational setup and actually implementing that in a way that it works well oiled hand in hand 
Okay, uh, great. The, uh, the next question is more of a comment than if you have a response for it. It says, great, thank you, much food for thought. I like the framework and is more dynamic than the McKinsey 7S. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> but um, I think what we did when we started this, and I still remember the day, um, we had about two months to look at all our frameworks and everything our our competition had and everybody else out there had in the academics. And uh, the person I'm driving that with, Martin and myself, we kind of sat in a room and we said, you know, all of that doesn't help us to, you know, explain and even, you know, help, you know, firms what is out there at the moment. So we really pushed everything we had, you know, off the desk and started, you know, with a clean sheet of paper. And that's where we ended up, you know, after two, three years of, of journey. And I really think there is a new need to kind of, you know, find a way to help management to, um, you know, embrace organization development, because very often organization development is not highly enough elevated. And therefore, you know, it doesn't get is sufficient attention, which I think is awfully needed in the days uh, ahead of us. Hey, great. The, uh, the next question is, is this also feasible for a nonprofit organization? Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I think it's not a matter of profit versus nonprofit. It's a matter of question, you know, do we have a challenge of um, you know, becoming more innovative or becoming more disruptive or creating new stuff in a nonprofit environment. Um, and then it applies 100%. So if you look at, we've worked with large R&D organizations, um, et cetera, but you know, it also applies to any other. I don't think it's a matter of profit versus nonprofit. It's just a question, how disruptive or how dynamic is my environment? And I, I like a term uh, a client of mine uses. He said, you know, the, the real challenge I feel, he said, is the outside world seems to be much more dynamic than my inside organization. And my struggle is how can I, you know, change my organization in a way that it can keep up with the external perceived dynamic change. And that is a lot of what we're trying to do. And it doesn't mean that you throw everything on board. You just have to understand where you keep things and where you add things. And that is the same for nonprofit. If your environment is changing faster in a nonprofit than you can cope with, then of course, you know, this works. That would be my response. Okay, thank you. And uh, as another reminder, as we're winding up in the last five minutes here, um, you can ask questions at any time. Just type them in the question box uh, on that toolbar on the right-hand side, and we will get to them as they come in. Uh, and the next question that we have is, how, I'm sorry, how much does it rely on the pioneering work done by Tushman Lowe those many years ago? Um, not a lot in a sense. Uh, it's been inspired by the thinking, but it really came only in the second step. We took all of those um, capabilities, we developed them, we looked at the pattern, and believe me, you know, my team and myself, we spent months kind of reconfigurating those patterns, and they look kind of logical at the moment. When we first had them in front of us, they were more like, uh, you know, uh, the result of a pump gun. Uh, shot. So we couldn't figure out what really we saw. Uh, only when we started playing with it and starting understanding it and working on it, we started understanding what it is. And I think what we then did when we found out what we really saw, then we felt, okay, you know, the only real concept that, uh, or a good ambidextrous and Riley and Tushman and all of that was a very good, you know, high level term to kind of codify that and describe it. But, you know, it was not, it was not inspired in detail by that. So it came later. Okay, so it appears we don't have any more questions in the queue. Um, 
Do you have, Wilhelm, do you have any comments, closing comments you'd like to make to see if we uh, get it in one, maybe one more question while we're waiting? Um, I think the, the real, no, the real challenge I'm seeing you know, in, in, in the work with the clients I have and the, 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 the companies out there is really bridging that gap between business strategy and organization. I, in many, many companies I, I've talked to and I work with and my colleagues work in, it feels like, you know, organization only gets addressed if something, if there is a new CEO or a new leader or if something goes awfully wrong and you start looking at it. But there is no, equi you know, no um, elevation of organization to a strategic level. And, you know, and there is a lack of senior people that really understand that. And even more, and that's probably the biggest benefit from, you know, my clients have derived from working with us on this is that they say we now finally have a language in our management team to talk about organization and to reflect in a common way of working, uh, common terminology or in a common language about what priorities we need to set and which direction we need to decide on for those priorities. So in that sense, it probably starts and ends with the leadership and the senior management that really has to embrace this and push it forward. And um, that's probably, you know, makes the difference between the companies that, you know, pay attention to this versus those that um, kind of, you know, lack behind. Okay, great. Uh, we're, we're just about out of time and we, uh, we don't have any more questions uh, on the topic to get to. So what we're going to do is we'll wrap it up now. Wilhelm, thank you very much for your time uh, thank you. on this informal session. I want to thank everyone for attending. And uh, should you have any questions or comments that you may have uh, not gotten to and you'd like to relay those to Wilhelm, you can definitely let me know. Uh, my email address is rwhalen, that's W-H-E, L-A-N at cutter.com, or you can also just send, simply send it to sales at cutter.com, and we will get them uh, to Wilhelm for an answer. Uh, at this time, I also want to let you know we do have a, a busy upcoming schedule uh, for other sessions coming up. They're on your screen right now. Um, there's uh, It's really a lot of sessions that we're plugging in. There's a lot more that we're just setting dates for. So if you go to cutter.com slash events, you'll see all of our events that are upcoming. And again, Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we hope all of you have a great day. Thank you.